Welcome to Invested in Climate. Protecting the planet and decarbonizing the global economy is the challenge of our time. Never before have so many people rallied around a common cause. We all have a role to play, and the opportunity we face is unprecedented. Invested in Climate aims to help people do more to address climate change through their work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism. I'm your host, Jason Rissman. I co-lead a climate venturing practice at the design firm IDEO, supporting early stage climate founders and organizations. I'm also an investor and startup advisor, and have realized that when it comes to climate action, I'll be a lifelong learner looking for the best ways to have a climate positive impact. If you like what you hear, give us a good rating on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you found us. Follow us on social, subscribe, and spread the word. Find episodes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. Thanks for joining. Agriculture is a pathway to peace. I think if you can have rural communities supporting themselves with their own food and energy needs, which agriculture can do, but enough to sell to other people, you have economic stability in the rural community, jobs, all kinds of things. But if you have economic stability, you generally have political stability as well. This is not just in the United States, but globally. And so I think Biodell is making a significant contribution to that rural economics. Hey, everyone. Welcome to an episode on ag tech, soil health, and regenerative agriculture. Here's some context. One of the big mysteries we're facing today is how we're possibly going to feed 10 billion people while transforming agricultural practices that are truly unsustainable. Modern farming is a technological marvel that has dramatically reduced hunger over the last century but it relies heavily on synthetic fertilizer that is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, and it's required intensive farming practices that have degraded soil's ability to grow food. To understand this issue better and learn about some potential solutions, I sat down with agricultural biologist Dr. Paul Zorner and BioDell Ag CEO Ben Cloud. They both bring decades of experience in agriculture and see some great potential in regenerative ag practices and innovative ag tech technology, including a new product called Sequester. I learned a lot from this conversation and think you'll enjoy it. Here we go. Paul and Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Where do I have you both dialing in from today? I'm in uh, Maricopa, Arizona, just outside of Phoenix. And Jason, I'm in a very rainy uh, Encinitas, California, just north of San Diego. Great. Well, I love both locations and have gotten to visit both. But yes, uh, we've got here in the Bay Area thunderstorms, so perhaps our listeners will get to hear some winter weather. But let's dive in. We have so much to talk about, and we're here to talk about soil. And really, so much of the climate conversation is about the atmosphere and what's above and around us, the parts per million of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the carbon pollution that is emitted into our skies, global temperatures, rain, like we just uh, discussed, and storms. We don't hear nearly as much about what's beneath our feet, yet soil is critical to human life on Earth. Let's get started first just by understanding the problem. What is happening to soil today, and why does it matter? Paul, let's start with you. Yeah, no, that's a great question, and one when I talk with my neighbors or or scientific colleagues, we have concerns. And I'd first start by saying, number one, you you and your listeners may have heard that, okay, we only have 60 harvests left if we don't protect of our soil. I don't think the situation is quite that dire, but it is important. You know, the Earth's soils contain three times as much carbon as the atmosphere, that's always a good reference point. You know, a lot of the a lot of the agricultural conversations around soil carbon or around drawdown of atmospheric carbon into soil in order to mitigate climate change. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I think the other thing to keep in mind that soil is, you know, carbon in soil is a very good thing, regardless of why you're interested in it. Carbon in soil feeds the microbiology that we'll talk about a little bit later in this interview. It increases soil uh, moisture holding capacity. It dictates a lot of things, but a lot of stuff has, has come to light lately in terms of soil as being a potential 
mediator for atmospheric carbon. Uh, Ratan Lal at Ohio State won the Japan Prize and the World Food Prize recently for his work here. Kind of states it elegantly in, in some of his papers. You know, he talks about the fact that we've lost uh, 133 pentagrams. That's 133 billion tons of carbon from soil over the last century, century and a half. So that's a big deal. But what's interesting is if all you do is replace that, that's worth about anywhere from 60 to 85 parts per million in the atmosphere. So in other words, he talks about it in the range of 2020 to 2100. But if you, over those 80 years, were able to put that much atmospheric carbon dioxide back into the soil, uh, you know, we're now at about 415 parts per million of CO2, just to do the rough math, you'd be down around 360. <laughs> that's like, wow, that's really exciting. On top of increasing organic matter, soil moisture holding capacity, a whole variety of things that carbon you know does for plants. I mean, basically CO2 in the atmosphere is a resource, not only for the plants, but for the microbiology that's in the soil that supports those plants as well. Okay. Thanks, uh, Paul. Uh, we get a good sense of the potential with soil, but you also mentioned that some people think the situation is as dire as saying that we only have 60 harvests left. And so I'd love to get into that just about soil health. Ben, is that where you might want to dive in and help us understand what's happening with the, the health of our soil? Well, society today is really at risk of the, uh, the sustainability of our food supply. And uh, because of the depleted condition of our soils in general, this uh, really creates a, a very real threat to our society going forward. And so it should, uh, should be taken very seriously. You know, we must rebalance the CO2 in our atmosphere if we want to reverse this. And uh, I think the good news is, is that we have the capability of doing it, which we'll discuss further as we go along. But uh, I, I think we can turn it around. It is possible just with agricultural properties alone to potentially take us back, as Paul was mentioning, back below 300, 350 range, even back to 280, because not only do we have to prevent the emission of carbon into the atmosphere, as the goal is uh, to accomplish that by 2050, but we still have the legacy gases that are still in the atmosphere that have to be also taken care of, which is the goal by 2100. Thanks, Ben. I love that you're both bringing up the need to rebalance the CO2 in our soil. And I'm excited for us to get into that and talk about solutions, and namely the solution you're both working on. But before we go there, let's understand more about the problem. Another factor commonly cited as degrading soil health is the overuse of synthetic fertilizers. Producing and using fertilizers are often called out for being a major contributor of greenhouse gases. But what about their impact on soil health? Some say it damages the biology of soil and contributes to intensive farming that wear down a soil's productivity, thus requiring even greater use of fertilizers. And yet we're completely dependent on them. According to the UN, 65% of people in the world were undernourished in 1950. And by the year 2000, that was cut to just 15%. So fertilizers have been central to this progress and our ability to feed billions of people over the last century but many say our dependence on them is just simply unsustainable. What do you think realistically will be the role of synthetic fertilizers in the future, given our dependency now, but also the damage that they're doing? I think it's important to take a look at today versus historical context. Agriculture is, is evolving constantly. And one thing I, I don't think any of us should do is to villainize agriculture. People are trying their hardest to be good stewards of the land and to use that technology that they have available to them. And I think we're beginning to wake up to some of the consequences of some of our historical conventional practices because we can measure them. We actually have the science to understand them. And we have overused fertilizers. I mean, they've been cheap insurance for, uh, for a long time. The, the fertilizer industry is realizing that, look, they're the four R's, for example. They, they talk about that. And that is right rate, right source, right placement, right timing. So I think we'll see a, a more careful consideration of what inorganic fertilizers to use and how to use them. But the fact remains that, for example, phosphate is a, is a definite resource that has a limitation. There's only so much phosphate in the world. So we've got to figure out how to use it more efficiently. Nitrogen is freely available in the atmosphere if we could just put it in the right form. And that's where soil biology comes into play. That 
literally, and we'll, we'll talk about cyanobacteria and sequester, the product that Ben's company makes. But those are free-living nitrogen-fixing uh, organisms that actually can take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a form that a plant can use. They also will liberate phosphate in the soil. There's a lot of phosphate sitting around in soil that just isn't available. And so I think in terms of damage, some of the things that are important to realize, it's not just the overuse or the inappropriate use of fertilizers, but it's too much tillage, no cover crops, you know, a whole variety of things that, you know, you would define as regenerative agriculture that are being organized to try to correct these problems and move growers towards practices that will help build soil rather than, than deplete it. I think technology can really do a great job of dealing with that. I don't know if you've read the book, but you and your listeners should read it. It's called The Wizard and the Prophet by Charles Mann. It's basically the discussion between William Vogt and, and Norman Borlaug. Norman Borlaug, I think most people would recognize, you know, Norman Borlaug is the wizard. William Vogt is the prophet. And, you know, I'm, I'm probably in Borlaug's camp as terms, look, technology can be a wonderful thing. And there, certainly there are consequences from time to time. But if we do things right, we can tend to overcome those consequences. So it's a great debate on that because there is no perfect right answer. But I think regenerative agriculture is recognizing that, look, we can do a better job of, of sustainably using scarce resources. And I would put fertilizers as scarce resources that should be used sparingly and with thought. And if we get soil biology right, We'll get plant nutrition right. Feed the soil, not the plant, is basically a lot of times what you got to think about. Well, let's go deeper into that because you mentioned that you'd, you'd like to talk more about soil health and soil biology. And so I think it's great to provide that context before we start getting into the solution. Uh, tell us what's on your mind. Well, I've done a lot of work in metagenomics. Metagenomics is, is the idea that, that there are multiple organisms in any particular ecosystem that contribute to the overall genome of the environment, an environmental genome. And each of them contribute a piece to full functionality. Well, the same thing exists in soils. It's clearly shown that plant genome response to microbial genomes, that one can't function without the other, just like your gut microbiome controls your physiology, your immune system, all kinds of things. Well, plants are no different. And so if you don't keep the microbes in a state where they're actually functional, you're not going to have that interaction. And it's, you know, one, one key thing is no brown soil ever. That's why you see cover crops. Plants literally exude about 30 to 40 percent of the photosynthate that they fix through photosynthesis out through their roots to feed these organisms because they need them. But if they're not there, <laughs> it doesn't do a lot of good to try to feed them. And they need to be a certain type of organism. There's a functionality associated with this. And the way I tend to talk about it with growers is, look, if you went out and bought a, a fully tricked out Ford F-250 uh, but you, you only had first gear in reverse and a five-gallon gas tank. Well, you might go somewhere, but you're not going to go very far or very fast. You need everything else in order to take advantage of that. Well, well, soil microbiology is the same. If you don't have the right components, even though there's 50,000 species of organisms you can find in the soil, if you don't have the right ones operating at a peak efficiency, it'd be like going to a concert and not having the violins there. It's just not going to be the same quality as it would be otherwise. So soil biology... And the constellation of microbes are extremely important in what you do. And those are supported by everything we've just got through talking about, you know, not too much fertilizer, not too much tillage, making sure you have cover crops so that they're constantly being fed through that photosynthate ex exuded through the roots, a whole variety of things that, again, fall under the umbrella of, of regenerative agriculture. Let's go deeper into that. Ben, you know, we've heard a, a little bit about regenerative agriculture from Paul, but it's something that you focus really deeply on. And you have a background having spent decades in farming. So you really bring a great perspective to this. So I'd love to just get a, you know, a high level general understanding of regenerative ag. What is it? And how would you describe the state of regenerative agriculture today in the world? Very quickly, regenerative agriculture is the uh, restoration of the soil's microbial life. Just as Paul has been describing, soil health is really driven uh, by the microorganisms and their association with plants. And uh, so regenerative agriculture is really just the restoration of the soil's microbial biomass and the maintenance of it year over year so that we are continuing to cycle carbon from the atmosphere, cycle water, cycle minerals, and even uh, cycling, uh, you know, nutrients, of course. But it also, uh, in our case, it includes uh, cycling salts, things that accumulate in the soil when 
the uh, soil microbiome is, is in a depleted state. And so uh, that's an indicator to us of poor soil health and something our product uh, helps to work with in, in restoring soil health. Today, the, uh, the momentum towards regenerative practices is, I would suggest, is increasing and increasing rather rapidly. You know, it's really taking hold and, and there's going to be uh, significant benefits for the work that's already going on. The key to it is, can it be sustainably uh, supported? Can a greater percentage of farmers uh, who are currently practicing conventional practices be moved towards regenerative practices so that we're having a positive effect on rebalancing the carbon in our atmosphere? So Ben, let me jump in there. It seems like it would be a win-win for everyone to practice regenerative agriculture. Farmers inherently have a strong interest in the health of the land and the soil that they're relying on year after year. But I remember from a previous conversation that we had that just about 5% of the 450 million acres of farmland in the U.S. is cultivated using regenerative ag practices. So what's really the barrier? What's holding us back from adopting regenerative practices that are better for the earth, but also better for the productivity of the soil that farmers rely on? I think, number one, you're right that farmers in general want to do the right thing and want to improve their soil. It's Soil is their really their greatest asset uh, to their enterprise. And so when they learn that they can utilize these practices and successfully grow high-yielding crops that might even provide a little better nutritional benefit and, and shift to a more sustainable model, they're generally for it. But the hindrance really is the economic challenge. The economic challenge is, is that most farmers are faced with a short-term single crop demand that they have to maintain profitability. The thought of maybe exposing themselves to uh, sustainable practices that oftentimes conventional growers look at as risky. And because of that risk factor, they tend to resist uh, the change. And so uh, moving forward, there's going to have to be economic incentives that allow the farmer to overcome those risk factors. Those incentives are going to come from government in the form of government incentives to sequester carbon. Also, I believe the private market for carbon credits is going to emerge much more strongly than it has to date. That's going to create the economic benefit that helps the the, uh, farmers take the the financial risk going forward. Great. Yeah. And I've heard about transition loans that might be one financial product to help farmers make this switch, but great to hear that there will be more economic incentives coming in the way from governments and and private markets. Paul, you want to jump in here. Back to the grower, it's about trust and advocacy. A lot of times, you know, if they're used to certain conventional practices, it's like, well, look, I've done this and I I don't know that I I, I have the time and the money to change because let's face it, a lot of growers are lease seeds. You know, they have a one to three year contract on that land and, you know, they don't necessarily have the ability to take the risk of of trying something different because they're going to be off the land by the time that long term impact hits versus the short term. And it's not just the grower and the advocacy there, but it's their lending institutions. FinTech is going to have to change finance tech. Like you just said, transition insurance, a whole variety of things. Banks have to understand that these new practices aren't a danger. They're actually an enablement so that they could provide potentially the, the grower with lower lower interest rate loans. Uh, a whole variety of things that I think we're, we're going to see here that are going to be important uh, to this. I would mention that the Soil Health Institute is another organization that you and your growers, if you're not familiar with, it should be familiar with. They've actually done some great work there in North Carolina of defining regenerative agriculture, but also a 100 grower survey in terms of, okay, what have people seen economically by transitioning to regenerative agriculture? And their results were amazing. They actually are very positive. It's a long-term plus where you talk to, simply I talk to people and they say, well, regen, well, it's great, you know, maybe five years from now, but I'm going to suffer between now and five years from now. Well, that's not necessarily the case if it's done right. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Really helpful. And we will make sure to include a link to the organization that you mentioned in the show notes. Ben, without further ado, let's talk about your company because you're doing some important work that can make a real difference here. And so your company is BioDell Ag and the product you've developed is named Sequester. As I learned about your company, I really loved hearing about your founding story. So as you get into talking about your company and your product uh, and how it can help, 
I'd love to also hear about your background as a farmer and how it led you to thinking about soil and the opportunity you're pursuing today. Certainly, Jason. You know, back in uh, 2001, I had made a trip to Australia with an agricultural leadership group. And and during that trip, we toured the Murray-Darling River area, which is in northern Victoria. Looking back, it was really a key point in time as far as my awareness and thought process towards climate change and what we're facing. Because during that trip, we saw that the, how the Murray-Darling River literally collapsed, where they were not able to supply all of their customers that were taking water previously to grow crops. It was a threat to their cities. All of the things that we're actually seeing today with the Colorado River system collapse here in the U.S. But this was 2001. And what caught my attention at that point in time was that we had a government official, a climatologist from the Australian government who spoke. And uh, he just made the comment. He, he said, what you Yanks don't understand is that in Australia, we're four degrees higher than you are. When you have a one degree difference in the latitudes in the United States, it's a four degree difference here. And therefore, you can keep an eye on us to see what's going to happen to you as you go forward. And I have certainly done that. In fact, I became a shareholder in a, a a farming enterprise in Australia just so I could keep up with what was happening in the region. And it certainly has been interesting and has been an example of what we're facing right now today in our particular region here in the southern Colorado River Basin. You know, that piqued my interest and, and uh, allowed me to begin looking at tools and ways to help uh, manage these issues. And uh, one of the things I got involved in was the algae biomass business. In 2005 to 2012, we had established a pilot facility to look at ways to commercialize algae biomass. And what we concluded after five years of operating this large pilot facility was that the highest and best use for the strains that we were growing, which are cyanobacteria strains, was actually as a soil amendment. At that point in time, it, it wasn't quite, uh, I, at least I felt it was a little too early uh, with regards to regenerative agriculture to make a business out of it. But then uh, when we formed Biodell Ag later in 2015, we pulled all that work back off the shelf and, and created a product called Sequester. Our customers have been really excited to see the capability, especially with regards to salinity, uh, saving water, and also reducing the amount of synthetic fertilizers they need to apply to achieve uh, high crop yields. We originally thought we'd start marketing this in about 2004, but because of what's been happening in our region, the drought conditions and the like, uh, we felt we needed to move this forward now. So 2023 is really our big year to start pushing our product into the marketplace. So years of research with algae biomass led you to see the opportunity for using cyanobacteria strains as soil amendments, which is basically something that you add to soil to change its chemical or physical characteristics. And because of droughts in the U.S., this is the year you're ready to bring it to market. Tell us more. Who are the customers you're serving? And what's the value proposition they see with your product sequester? We break our market segments into three categories. Number one is commercial farmers that are, uh, are growing any kind of crop. Our product can be applied to any crop type. We're really focused upon the soil and the soil health. So commercial growers is, is a primary category. Then we also focus on large uh, land ownership groups that hold ag lands that are really looking to the future to begin developing and marketing their carbon credits. And uh, our product is a real driver of that process to accumulate greater soil organic matter and, and carbon in the soil so that uh, ultimately that can be an additional income source for those, those large acreages. And then the third category for us is what we call the residential landscape, uh, small farm category. And uh, those are you know, smaller, they're unable to really sell their carbon credits generally, but they all want to do their part. And so they can buy our products at uh, sequester.ag and uh, can uh, apply it to their yards, uh, small farms, 
and so forth. So uh, those are our three primary market categories. Great. Thanks, Ben. And we'll include the link for, to your website in the show notes as well. And again, it really sounds like for both of the problems that we talked about with soils, one is the uh, underlying health and the long-term productivity of the soil. And two, in terms of soil's capability of sequestering carbon, it seems like your product is helpful on both accounts and at both a, a large and a small scale. Is, is that right? Or anything you'd want to revise in how I described it? No, that's certainly the case. There is not a limitation to production. We could literally produce one acre of cyanobacteria production, which is the primary ingredient in sequester, can treat over 400,000 acres. So uh, we can scale production as our customer base is ready to accept it. I was just going to say, I, I, you know, I would like to comment as a biologist. I mean, cyanobacteria are remarkable organisms. I get really excited when I think about them. I mean, A, they're one of the oldest organisms on Earth, uh, you know, billions of years. They literally are credited with creating an oxygen environment in our atmosphere that allows everybody else to survive here. So they've had a long time to adapt to rough conditions. And they can do so many different things. I don't know how many people follow baseball or football, but they're like a utility infielder in baseball or a Mike linebacker in football. You know, they can do so many different things, as Ben mentioned. And, it, you know, the carbon sequestration is an important part of this. But that's longer term, near term. The salinity management, the nitrogen fixation is so powerful. They literally will take salinity out of circulation, like as much as 30% of salinity in a grower's field within the first year. And in the Western United States, where Ben and I live, that's a big deal. And the nitrogen fixation is remarkable as well. These are what, what people would call a free living nitrogen fixing organism. But the thing is, they're what's called autotrophic, they can make their own energy. Most other nitrogen-fixing organisms have to get their energy from somewhere else. These guys can make their own. It's just, it's stunning. They can contribute a remarkable amount of usable nitrogen from the atmosphere. But what's really cool, they're what is called facultative heterotrophs. In other words, if the sunlight disappears and they, they follow the roots down and colonize them, they can all of a sudden switch to feeding off of the, the, the plant root exudates that we talked about earlier. I just find them absolutely fascinating in terms of, of, of what they can do. And the, the key thing about Biodel that got me interested in them, not only did they figure this out with the composition of you know the different cyanobacteria that they use, but they're also able to make them in a way that allows them to apply enough of the organism to actually make a difference. There's a process called quorum sensing that, you know, we all know what a quorum is. Well, you have to have enough stuff there to actually make a difference. You don't want to bring the SWAT team with what you need as an army. And, and Biodel has figured out how to manufacture this so they can put enough out at a reasonable enough cost that the grower can really benefit from all these wonderful attributes that the biology of Santa Bacteria bring to the table. Thanks, Paul. You know, we haven't really had a chance to hear your story yet. And I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, your background and how you came across Ben and his team. And maybe they'll provide some context to why it is that you're so excited. Oh, God, I'm, so, I'm, I'm too old to tell you everything. <laughs> I grew up on a farm in Oregon. I'm an agricultural biologist. I have a PhD in botany and plant pathology. I worked on dry land agriculture systems. Uh, I've been an adjunct professor of horticulture at North Carolina State University for 35 years. I was the chief scientist for Dow Chemical's global biotechnology platform. Uh, I was the VP of product development at Mycogen Corporation, a senior person at Diversa. I mean, I could just go on and on in terms of all the things that I've done. But it's all come to grips with, in my view, what I like to do is to bring innovation to agriculture to improve productivity per unit of land, per megaliter of water, per dollar of invested capital for the grower and his invested capital. And that's so important in terms of what we're, what we're doing. And, and, and Sequester really helps to do that. And Ben and I have been friends for a long time. I met Ben while we were both working with Ulex, which is a company that used a, a shrub called Wayuli to make a, a domestic source of rubber which is a whole other story in its, in its own right. But that's where Ben and I got to know each other. And when he started telling me about what he was doing with cyanobacteria, being a person that has started several companies in terms of microbial soil amendments, I just said, man, this is, this is a thing to be looking at here. I think it's a missing piece and a missing link in terms of modern agricultural practice. So help us understand that potential that you see. What does success look like for Sequester and how much impact do you think it can have? How big is the opportunity? both for sequester as well as for agriculture and productivity? 
Well, it's 400 million acres of uh, agronomic land in the U.S., another 600 acres of uh, range and pasture land. So there's a billion acres. So there, there you go. But you can't address that if you can't scale it. Ben can easily scale to do this. But I'll go back to the salt and the, the nitrogen fixation. I mean, salt is an increasing problem almost anywhere. Most of our aquifers are becoming more and more concentrated in terms of dissolved solids. I mean, you can literally just see salt forming on a lot of lands in, in, in the United States. And that just impacts upon productivity in a, in a remarkably negative way. Or nitrogen management. 2023 is the year of California's nitrogen compliance plans. You better learn how to, how to reduce your nitrogen or you're going to be in real trouble. But you've got to do it without reducing your yields. You're going to have to have some type of biological nitrogen fixation. So I think, I think the impact the immediate impact is huge with respect to managing those two immediate problems as well as water use uh, efficiency. Long term, I think it's a great way of helping growers achieve stability and a, and a contribution to participating in these both compliance and voluntary carbon markets, which will add income to rural America. Agriculture is a pathway to peace. I think if you can have rural communities supporting themselves with their own food and energy needs, which agriculture can do, but enough to sell to other people. You have economic stability in the rural community, jobs, all kinds of things. But if you have economic stability, you generally have political stability as well. This is not just in the United States, but globally. And so I think Biodell is making a significant contribution to that rural economic security that we're talking about for all the reasons we've talked about over the past half hour or so. Thanks so much, Paul. Ben, we now have a sense of your potential and what scale might look like. Tell us about the next couple of years. What's it going to take to get there? Well, the next couple of years, I think, are really essential to uh, determining whether the market is going to accept this type of product or not. There's many other types of products that are similar, uh, biological in nature, and uh, have nothing negative to say about any of those. It's just acceptance of our particular product in the marketplace and how successful we are in uh, creating awareness and, you know, helping to support growers. And, and in fact, uh, I think there's a training element that's involved that uh, we're really looking to, uh, uh, to focus on. Uh, and, but we're also looking at the very long term. So, you know, the next couple of years are going to do what they do to, uh, to introduce this product into the marketplace. But for the very long term, as customers begin to see the results and the results are measurable in terms of increasing organic matter year over year, which means more carbon is being sequestered and that can actually be converted into marketable carbon credits. It's going to be very interesting. You know, you talk about the future and the, the at least I talk about the incentives, the economic incentives for growers to use these kind of products and uh, shift to regenerative practices. You know, I would suggest to you that there's literally going to be trillions of dollars thrown at agriculture in particular worldwide to sequester carbon. This train is just really starting to pull out of the station and it's going to uh, begin moving with greater momentum with each passing year. So we feel really positive that we have the right product at the right time and can help move us towards uh, rebalancing the carbon in our atmosphere, as well as creating the sustainability of our food supply. That's really essential for the population levels that we're, we're at now and most likely will be growing towards in the future. Great. Thanks, Ben. That intersection between ag tech and climate tech is so important and certainly heating up and increasingly crowded. So we understand that the sequester product isn't the only solution. And Paul, I think you have some perspective on this. You've worked with investors across this space for a long time and have a sense of what else is needed and where else there's opportunity. And so I'm curious, how would you characterize the ag tech market today and its potential for contributing to climate solutions? And what are some of the other opportunity areas that you're excited about? Well, yeah, I do have a lot of experience there. Um, you know, I've worked for venture capital. I've worked for private equity. I'm currently the chair of the governing board of a coalition called the Alternative Fuels and Chemicals Co Coalition that is working to expand a bio-based economy. We do a lot of work here. And I think one of the things driving this is that companies and all kinds of organizations and governments are you know, announcing their net zero commitments, hopefully true zero at some point in time. 
and they're being held to them. I mean, they've, they've got a report on them. It's just a, not a matter of saying, oh, we're going to do this and then waving your hands and going away and letting the next generation deal with it. They've got to show commitment to that as well as the brand promise. Consumers care about this. I've been doing a lot of work with Dr. Jay Golden at Syracuse University at his Dynamic Sustainability Lab. That's another site people should get on. It's a lot of good work doing that. We're developing a carbon intensity, consumer-facing carbon intensity label that we hope to install through the Farm Bill and in the BioPreferred program, like a USDA organic, but in this case, a USDA carbon intensity seal that people could go shopping for a gold or a green product and be comfortable that they actually are getting what they're shopping for. So people care. That's number one. That's what's going to drive a lot of this. The other thing, there was a great article by Nick Milanovic and Forbes just a couple of days ago talking about fintech and, and what's happening. And, you know, he made the point that, you know, farms contribute $134 billion to the 2020 U.S. GDP. But if you look at related industries, it's a trillion dollars. That's 5% of the U.S. GDP. So not only do we need to care about agriculture because we've got to eat, but we've got to care about agriculture because it's a major source of our economy. And people aren't just going to let this go by the wayside. And as Ben says, I think what we're seeing related to these net zero pronouncements, that the only way people are going to be able to do that, the most scalable solution for humanity is agriculture. I talked about a billion acres in the United States. There's 5 billion acres of ag land globally. And so you think about that, it's a remarkable canvas on which people can paint. And you've got about 2 billion people globally that work in agriculture. You know, the percentage of the population in the U.S. is only about 1%, but a lot of times it's as much as 25 to 40% in other countries. So just imagine that you've got 2 billion people working on 5 billion acres to try to do this once we do the proper advocacy and also inform the general public and get them from thinking about agriculture as a problem to being agriculture as a solution and voting with their pocketbooks with every purchase to buy products that have been regenerative or have the right type of carbon intensity seal on them. That'll just trickle down through the system as well. So I see a major shift coming in the next five years, maybe even sooner. Even now, people are beginning to, to do these types of things. And then other things excited about, like I said, fintech. I think some of the, some of the issues here are, all right, well, what are low-tech solutions to be able to actually measure soil carbon? How do you study the soil microbiology you know, with the proper metagenomic techniques? There's robotics, there's metagenomics, as I just mentioned. There's the whole understanding of microbial and plant genomic interaction, which is very powerful. Epigenetic movements, you know, you know, epigenetics are, are, are what actually controls plant gene expression. And there, there are ways of, of influencing that through volatile, you know, natural organic compounds. I'm working on a project like that with a professor at UC Riverside, Dr. Anand Ray. We could just go on and on in terms of the brain trust that's working to bring new innovations to agriculture right now. Financially, technically, socially, you know, what have you. Because in the end, it's also about resolving problems in food deserts, you know, making sure people that we democratize access to healthy food, that we provide people not with jobs, but careers. I mean, it just, it just goes on and on. And it's an exciting time to be involved in agriculture because the technology now is allowing us to get to the point where we can actually do something meaningful to improve people's lives and to improve the, you know, the sustainability of the world in which we live. Well, a question for both of you. What about innovation gaps? What about areas where there just isn't enough attention and where you wish that more people were investing, both financially as well as their entrepreneurial abilities, problems that aren't getting enough attention that you hope or think need to be solved? We have got to have better analytics. You can't control what you can't measure, period. And right now, uh, I think also to engender consumer trust. You know, if we said we've put a metric ton of atmospheric carbon in the ground and kept it there for a period of time, then we need to be sure that that's what we did. That it's not a metric ton plus or minus a metric ton. You know, we have to be able to tell what's, what's going on. And so a lot of people, ARPA-E and others included, the government, are putting a lot of work into doing that. If I had to say one thing, I would say improved analytics in terms of what we're doing. And then I could go on and talk about fintech and a variety of other things. But I think analytics are a really important part of this. You can see why I really do appreciate working with Paul so much. He, he's so knowledgeable and has such a great perspective of this entire field. From my position, I think the one area that's a challenge is, is just consumer awareness in general. There's got to be a vehicle through which the average consumer out there recognizes the importance of biology in our, 
our society as it relates to agriculture and our ability to cycle carbon out of the atmosphere. We're really messing with fire not to be dealing with this issue strongly. I'm optimistic that I see a uh, movement moving forward that's uh, going to be significant. But the, uh, the big question is, is it going to be enough and is it going to be soon enough? Otherwise, our, our society could really be challenged in the ability to adapt to these climate conditions. So as Paul mentioned, agriculture really is probably the most economical with the greatest ability to scale and deal with this issue of carbon sequestration. It's not just sequestration, it's emissions. It's dealing with other greenhouse gas emissions like nitrous oxide and the like that uh, we haven't even really touched on much in this conversation. But all of that is really essential and how we get people aware of this enough to uh, you know, make greater investment and make better choices, especially for ag land owners in the country as well as around the world is really, uh, to me, the essential step going forward. Well, let's look a little bit further out. Since we're at the start of a new year, everyone's talking about predictions. And since we're talking about something as monumental as the ground beneath our feet and the soil that grows our food, I think it's fair to take a a longer term view than just thinking about 2023. So let's talk about the next decade. Given what you're seeing in the ag tech market, what do you believe we are on track to be able to achieve in terms of soil health and soil sequestration potential? We're seeing an accelerating adoption of regenerative practices because I think we're able to show growers and landowners the economic benefit of adopting this. I think we're going to see a constellation of carbon market dynamics that's going to be solidified. There are many companies out there that are looking to purchase valid, you know, defendable carbon offsets. You know, I'm sure everybody's seen the John Oliver piece or you know, a variety of other things where people will, will villainize offsets, sometimes for good reasons, a lot of times for bad reasons. But I think it comes back to the analytical that I mentioned. These analytical techniques are there. The technology is not a limitation here. I think right now it's advocacy. And I think within the next five years, we will see an explosion in terms of the economic value of these carbon markets to growers, which will in turn will allow them to have more confidence in adapting these practices. It's not going to take 10 years. It's going to be five years, I think, in which you're doing this. And it's going to be significant, I think, with the other practices, cover crops, minimum tillage, manure applications, a whole variety of other techniques. Yeah, I know probably my colleagues probably would debate this with me, but you can make significant contributions to soil carbon. I've seen references where, where people will say, well, we could add 1% organic matter to a soil over the period of two to three years. Uh, or literally grow soil. I forget who it was, and I should I should have studied up on this, where there were a couple of scientists that were talking about actually growing soil. You could add a, I think it was a centimeter every two years or something along those lines, such that in 20 years you might be able to add, hmm. you know, like a half a foot of soil. Wow, <laughs> it just blows my mind. You know, when you think about people saying that, okay, we only have 60 harvests left, well, what if we just reverse that process? You can grow soil, right? I mean, that's what happens over... Over thousands of years, well, I think with technology, we can learn how to accelerate that and, and not only stop the process of loss, but actually reverse it and begin to grow soil back again. I think the future is very bright. But what we've got to do is we, we have got to advocate and get the general consumer involved. Agriculture cannot be villainized. It is not the problem. It is the solution. And I think we as agricultural biologists and business owners and things have to spend less time talking to each other, more time talking to the general public. Thanks, Paul. Ben, take us home. Well, I'd like to, number one, say that I think that the ability of farmers to adapt can be very, very rapid. And I'm seeing signs of that where I think we will adopt regenerative practices at, a, at an ever faster rate. Many growers have already one or two practices, for example, but there needs to be a comprehensive approach Uh, That, again, is measurable. As Paul mentioned, the analytics is really critical. They've got to be able to measure performance and be confident that what they're applying today is going to benefit them, whether it's this crop cycle or two or three crop cycles down the road. That's an important factor. I tend to keep coming back to the economic side of this. And I think that the the economic world that uh, farmers live in today is going to be much more efficient 
I think it's going to have a much more long-term view. Uh, right now, farmers typically are just focused on a single crop cycle and scared to death they're not going to generate enough revenue to cover this year's expenses, especially when we're experiencing uh, situations like we are today with fertilizer prices going up exponentially. And so the good news is that the greater our ability as a society to take a longer term view to our food supply is going to create greater sustainability. With that in hand as a society, we would have an ability to really continue to manage our our atmosphere, in essence, our climate. You know, you think about it, today we're at 420 or so parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, which was recently measured in Hawaii at 420 parts per million. If over the next 75 years or so that we could bring that back down to below 300, we have an ability to create a sustainable environment. So it's not just the immediate solution to making society more functional and capable. It's the longer term sustainability of society in general. So I, I'm optimistic about the long term. Short term is still challenging from time to time. And we'll see if the politics support the, uh, uh, the reality of what we're dealing with. But I'm optimistic. Ben, Paul, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really grateful for the time that you carved out and really grateful for the work that you're doing. Thank you, Jason. Great. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Invested in Climate. Please remember to rate us on Apple, Spotify, or Google. Find show notes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute financial, accounting, or legal advice. Thanks again.